Howdy folks, welcome back to Steampunk Desk Browder channel. I would like to introduce my guest, Sir Nicholas the Steam Hound. Old Nick is here to celebrate today's topic, Dogs of the Future. You can, see, you can see he's very excited about that. For what would the future be like without man's best friend? <coughs> yeah, that's right. It would be rough, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, there are a few things that Sir Nicholas likes better than patrolling the neighborhood every morning. And that's when I get some of my best ideas. And I was thinking, dogs of the future. Of course, of course, dogs in science fiction. And, you know, I quickly discovered there was a lot more of them than I thought. And, and, and Sir Nicholas was surprised too, weren't you? <laughs> yes, he was. So, Sir Nicholas had some urgent business to take care of. Something about the postman, and also he had to check on the cats and make sure they were behaving themselves. To start off, to start off, I must say that dogs have already had a role in the future, and that is in a space exploration. There was a first space dog. She was named Laika from the Soviet Union, and this was back in 1957. She was the first creature of any kind, including people, to orbit the Earth. Now, Laika was a stray monger from the streets of Moscow. And they put her aboard the Sputnik 2 spacecraft, which was launched in the orbit on the 3rd of November 1957. As the technology was not developed to land, unfortunately, and it's something I didn't know as a child, <laughs> I would have been pretty upset. Poor Laika burned up on re-entry. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, she was a hero. And in fact, the Russians, they had postage stamps in her honor. They even had a cigarette brand called Laika <laughs> and matches and a matchbook with her face on it. Other space missions, they did figure out how they were going to land. And the next two space dogs, Belka and Strelka, did survive, which is awesome. Unfortunately, <laughs> the next couple had uh, some disasters, so a few more dogs perished in the cause. As I said, there's many examples of dogs playing important roles in science fiction because dogs belong in the future. The first and most obvious is that of a pet, and that is the role of Porthos the Beagle in Star Trek Enterprise because he is Captain Archer's pet. He's like the first pet to appear on Star Trek, unless you count the Tribbles. And one pretty outrageous thing about the Wikipedia article on this series is that Porthos is not mentioned as a character. How dare they? Another one in this category is Muffet the Robot Dog from the original Battlestar Galactica, 1978. Now, he's a replacement for a living pet of a boy named Boxy, who was part of the refugee fleet around the Battlestar. And since his original dog perished in the Cylon attack, there are no more dogs, sad to say. But because it's silly, and this was really cringe, they had to make up a different word for everything that had anything to do with Earth, since they're not from Earth. So he was called a Daggett. That's what Muffy was called. And he's obviously a dog, though. Now, dogs in real life, they're a lot more than pets for a lot of people. They can be helpers and they can be protectors, and it is the same in science fiction. Let's talk about Samantha the German Shepherd from I Am Legend. Now, the original story was a 1954 novel by Richard Matheson, and this was made into movies four, no, three times, three times, and the third time was the best. It was actually had the same name, I Am Legend, and it starred Will Smith as. Robert Neville, the last man on Earth, and he's the last man who's not been infected with the zombie plague. And his dog, Samantha, she's a German Shepherd, and she helps protect him. You know, she can alert him if the zombies are coming too nearby, and uh, also keeps him company. And so she's kind of heroic. She's she's helping to be part of the pack, to survive. The next one, the next one. Where is this guy? Oh, here he is. The next one is Ein the Corgi. Here's Ein. 
Here's a, a toy version of Ein. Ein the Corgi from Cowboy Bebop. The great anime from 1998-99. He is a crew member on the ship Bebop. Along with Spike and Jet and Faye and Edward. He is a genetically engineered Welsh Corgi with near-human intelligence. Who is designed to smuggle information, which is why he is called a data dog. That's, that's Jet talking. Data dog. Next of the famous dogs of the future is K-9, the robot dog from Doctor Who. And this is from the early part of the series uh, where uh, Tom Baker is playing Doctor Who. It's in the 1970s. And K-9 is a very stylized dog with a vast computer memory. So he, he's networked. He's like a living, talking computer. Not quite living, but you know what I mean. And he has a very cool laser beam in his nose. <laughs> That's a little hidden weapon there. And in particular, I loved how Doctor Who would always pretend that he was a real dog. He would come into the TARDIS, uh, you know, which is his vehicle, his vehicle and his home. And he would say, back, canine, get back, get back, don't jump. That kind of thing. Well, of course, canine's there on the floor saying, hello, master. <laughs> how are you, master? And uh, so he was very cool. Kids loved him. And unfortunately, they kind of phased him out because they gave him to Romana, one of Doctor Who's companions when she exited the series in 1981. But canine was back occasionally and he had a couple more uh, upgrades and he became a little different. And he appeared as recently as 2010. Another common theme in sci-fi is to have certain animals be uplifted, as we call it, to, so that they are sapient, so that they become in, as intelligent as people. And this is usually through genetic engineering. Now, most often the animals are chimps or apes or dolphins, but dogs have had their role in this, in this idea. Now, the one that springs to mind is a 1952 novel by Clifford Simic, one of the great uh, grandmasters of science fiction, and this was well-received. It got the World Fantasy Award in 52. It is a series of related short stories, most of whom were published earlier, but they're all tied together by this narration from the dogs of the future. These are dogs who can talk, and they are researchers, and they're saying, uh, these are the stories we tell our pups, but do people really exist? Well, we don't see any. We think they may have existed or they may not. You know, Rover says yes, and, and Spike says no, they never existed. <laughs> uh, so it involves this family called Webster, of humans, that is, and they had a big role to play in the future of mankind, and indeed one of the roles they played was to teach dogs how to talk. And this was through surgery and contact lenses and so on, so dogs could talk and read. And uh, so the first talking dog was Nathaniel. And so he's considered the first dog. And also, somehow they were inheriting this characteristic, uh, which is kind of silly, but you could say that perhaps the robots, which the humans left to take care of the dogs, be their hands and so on, the robots may have been doing this for them. Who knows? So it's pretty cool. Later on, the humans exit, exit the stage. They all go to Jupiter to be in this weird paradise <laughs> in the clouds of Jupiter. And uh, so the dogs are on their own and they have their own like animal society uh, where they try to uh, have everybody live together just like a Zootopia. It's pretty amusing. An uplifted dog is also one of the heroes of Dean Koontz's book, Watchers. His name is Einstein. He's a golden retriever, genetically engineered, of course, and he escapes from a lab. And he is pursued by another escaping from the lab, the outsider, who is like this vicious baboon-like thing. And I think the idea is it's like a defense project, and Einstein is the ideal spy, because he's a dog who can understand human speech and even read. And he can write with his paw on a special keyboard. And the, the, the outsider is probably a warrior. The outsider hates the dog because people love the dog and they fear him. So he's trying to kill the dog. So the dog flees. 
a guy named Travis Cornell. He's like a special forces veteran, has to help protect them. And they enlist a young woman to help them. And uh, it's a very fun and touching story. Now, here's one where they're not real dogs, but they're a society of dog-like aliens. And so it probably doesn't quite belong in this category, but I'll put it in here anyway. And they're called the Tynes. And they are the major characters in the Werner Vinge novels Fire Upon the Deep, 92, and Children of the Sky, 2011. They are four-legged carnivores who are much like our dogs, but they are only sapient when they are in a pack. Uh, that is like four to eight individuals because they have telepathy. And so if they are close to, enough together, like say maybe in the same room or you know within 100 feet of each other, I suppose, they can think like a human. And because they have each has a mouth, it's like having multiple hands that they can manipulate stuff. Now, there's human children in the story who are actually fleeing this evil alien intelligence. You know, the, the dogs, not the dogs, but the tines have to try and help them prepare. So it's an exciting story with a lot of great ideas about how this kind of weird dog-like society would function. Finally, and this is my favorite, this is my favorite, Uplifted Dogs are major characters in Travis J.I. Corcoran's Aristillus series. Two books, two books a, about a libertarian colony on the moon. And the books are called Powers of the Earth and Causes of Separation, both published in 2017 and winners of the Prometheus Award. Now, this colony on the moon, they kind of found it secretly because this you know, genius guy developed anti-grav technology. And so they were able to found this colony under the ground on the moon. And they're very prosperous and they're very peaceful. And the greedy, corrupt governments of the Earth, especially the USA, say, hey, this is plunder for us. And we have to make up our budget. So they're planning to invade. <laughs> and so this one group of characters are literally dogs. They have been uplifted. There was a lab in the United States. The government, in its usual inept idiocy, decides that genetically engineering dogs is now illegal and that these dogs must be destroyed. However, these dogs are like people. And the caretaker of the dogs, John, says, nope, not going to happen. So he flees to the moon with the dogs. And there's, you know, there's males and females. They're going to continue with this dog society. But there's four dogs in particular that are the best friends of John. And they're going on a hike across the far side of the moon in their doggy space suits. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. And they have all these these uh, discussions about philosophy and technology and whether man can be trusted because, you know, they, they murdered our kind and they even murdered their own. And so it's it's pretty amusing. But my favorite character is Duncan, who is kind of autistic and he's very brilliant, but he's like, oh, wait, what? I, I don't get it. And that kind of thing. So highly recommend this series. It's pretty cool. A lot of exciting fun. Sir Nick is back and he's asked me to remind you since he can't speak English that dogs have a major role to play in the future. <laughs> this is the steampunk desperado and and Sir Nick saying adios amigos and woof from, from the steampunk desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Extraordinary. <laughs>